Hi everyone, welcome once again to my show, Ask the Cheese Doctor. Um, this is my channel, Dr. Quesero TV, and this show is only in English dedicated to the people who wants to learn how to make cheese. Uh, my name is Dietrich Truxes, and I live in New Zealand, and I'm a cheese maker. Well, I'm also a civil engineer, but this is my passion, and I teach people how to make cheese, um, and well, if you want to learn how to make cheese, come to my show every Sunday. It was it used to be every Saturday at eleven o'clock New Zealand time, but I changed it because I have a lot of viewers from Saudi Arabia, India, China, um, Lebanon, etc. Et <coughs> and and the idea is that you guys learn how to make cheese. Uh, I have the show for the American people and people from America and also South America, Europe. And in in this version of Ask the Cheese Doctor, uh, I attend this um, this population, okay? So um, welcome to my show. Today we're gonna speak about the a very interesting process when we ripen cheese. When we ripen cheese, we have to tune the process. We have some time to refine and the maturation process, the aging process of the cheese. And this is what I want to teach you. I want to teach you how to do it, what what to consider, uh, and we're also going to answer all the um, questions of my audience. Every week I have a lot of questions from people uh, from around the planet asking me cheese questions, and this is the spot that I find where I can dedicate the time that you need to... Um, and, and the, the, the time that I have to answer all these questions. And <clears throat> beside that, I do, I always also, as I said, I'm a civil engineer and I work as a civil engineer. So I dedicated this time. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see how we are here. Um, I have the presentation here. Let me share the screen. Uh, if you have any questions, I have questions here as I said from the audience and I'm going to answer them and now people are already starting to connect that's very good I'm very happy for it um, and the idea is that if you have any question about cheese making you can answer it here because I will answer it for you no cost free of cost <laughs> okay um, let's start with the presentation as I said we're gonna speak about um, right, refining cheese. Let me share the screen, and I'm going to go with the presentation. Okay. Um, okay. Here we are. Wait. Here we are. Okay. 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 There we are. Uh, let me go with the first. Okay, this is our program number 12. It's been three months since I started making the English version of my As the Cheese Doctor program. And we're going, as I said, we're going to speak about the tuning, <coughs> the tuning of ripening cheeses. Okay. Um, ripening cheeses is not make the cheese, put it in the fridge, and let it get old. No, it's, it has... It is more interesting than that. It's more complicated than that. And the, each person that makes cheese or each person that know or, or understand the process of, make, of cheese making um, can be a tuner, okay? A, 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 in, in French, it's affineur. It's an affineur. Um, so what is tuning? Talking about cheese making, what is tuning? Tuning is the is the process of controlling the cheese maturation, okay, or the cheese ripening, taking care of the rind of the cheese, the temperature, the humidity level, the organisms that live into the cheese, okay, and understanding the process, the enzymes that the cheese have, okay, and the idea is to have um, a good quality product product at the end of the process. Each tuner or each affineur 
give his personal touch to the cheese and, and during the, the, um, the maturing process, okay? The premises to, the, to tune the cheese is that to be a tuner or a, an affineur, you don't have to be a cheese maker. Uh, you don't have to be um, a cheese maker. You have to understand the process of making cheese. Of course, um, a cheese maker can be a tuner, but a tuner not necessarily have to be a cheese maker. It okay? can be a cheese monk, for example. A cheese monk is a person that has a lot of experience making, um, selling cheese. They, they understand the process of cheese making and it could perfectly be a, 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 um, an affiliate, okay, or a cheese or a cheese uh, a tuner, <clears throat> okay. Um, to tune a cheese accordingly, we have to create the ideal the ideal conditions of the biochemical process into the cheese in order um, when the when the cheese achieves its maturation, okay, or its ripening process, okay. Um, this refining process will depend on the speed of the cheese, uh, on, the, on the ripening speed. It can be days, for example, if you're making camembert. <coughs> camembert cheese is a, is a cheese that it has a very, a very short aging life because you ripen a, a camembert in max three months. Okay, I would say two months. But it also can be months. For example, um, if you are ripening manchego cheese, uh, you can ripen it for 18 months. Or you can ripen it also for years, five years, six years. I ate a pecorino once when I was studying in the New Zealand cheese school. I ate a pecorino cheese that had eight years. <coughs> it was all in, in, in a vacuum pack, but it has... Uh, it had this, this still all the way, and the, the cheese was floating into the sack or into the bag with the whey and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the cheese. It was disgusting. Um, when, I, when we opened the, this bag, all the way went up. I thought it was rotten, but it wasn't, uh, and the cheese was fantastic. So um, my teacher, by that time, Neil Wilman, he um, ripened the cheese for eight years. And we tried this day in, during, the, during this class, and the cheese was outstanding, okay? Um, <clears throat> not every tuner is the same, because as I said, tuning the cheese depends on the personality of the cheese, of the tuner. I can tune a cheese in a way, and someone else can tune it in another way, um, because I will give him my personal touch, and the other person will give him their personal touch. Okay, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the main agent responsible, another premise is that the main agent responsible for the refining process, okay, which will give the cheese its ideal qualities are microorganism and enzymes. When you make cheese, <clears throat> when you make cheese, um, cheese is a live organism, it's a live, it's a live being. It has bacteria inside that are growing into the into the cheese. They are feeding from the lactose. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking about the lactic bacteria. They are feeding feeding from the lactose and producing lactic acid. But um, eventually, this bacteria dies because the humidity or the moisture level of the cheese uh, tends to reduce. The bacteria doesn't have much uh, much more lactic acid, and eventually. They starve and they die. But they, after dying, they produce enzyme the, during the during the um, the acidification process. They produce enzymes, and <coughs> these enzymes will change the texture and the flavor of the cheese. And this is what the cheesemaker knows, and also the the affineur that he he knows that. So, <coughs> in, in order in order to achieve a good product. The uh, the ripe the, the tuner have to plan plan the proper programming of the evolution of the cheese. He will know what happened to the cheese and will take the necessary steps. For example, sometimes when we ripen <coughs> uh, cheddar, when we make cheddar, 
there is a process that when we when we apply the rennet the 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 enzyme into the rennet break the um, the casein in uh, the casein into smaller molecules called peptides this peptide during the maturation process they will tend to be bitter and the affinier or, or the tuner should know that and but this bitterness will disappear during the aging process so um a good ripener a good tuner will know that and he will say for example <clears throat> sorry he will say for example we can eat this cheese at three months because at three months is when the the um, bitter is developed into the cheese and we have to wait for the bitterness this bitterness to disappear which will will which will disappear along the along the way during the maturation process okay so um that's that, that that's um what the affiner or the tuner needs to know okay why we finish <clears throat> why we tune a, a cheese what is the purpose this is wrong here it's not why we finish a cheese it's why we tune a cheese or why we yeah we ripen a cheese we we um yeah the, the work is why we tune up a cheese the final goal is to get the best flavor of the cheese okay okay <clears throat> now now that we know more or less what is the ripe the um, the, the refining process of the of the cheese mat, 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 uh, maturation i'm going to teach you how you can tune a cheese in general terms because as i said you have to there is not good answers or wrong answers because remember you are giving your personal touch when you are ripening your cheese, a cheese so but in general terms when you are making a cheese you normally salt the cheese you can salt it either way by rubbing the cheese with salt or by putting it in the, into the brine. <coughs> you can use any brine, 20% solution, 15% solution like mozzarella. Um, is, is the choice as a cheese maker what type of salt you're going to use. But after you salt the cheese, <coughs> you have to let it dry. And this is the aeration phase of the of the uh after you made the cheese you have to allow the cheese to get dry during this during, during this phase during this this time frame there is a narration process okay um after that in this aeration process all the way all the water that comes from the brine will tend to evaporate and after evaporating the cheese will develop the rind okay and you can it will be dry to touch in this pro in this this time frame can be between seven or 30 days depending of the cheese okay <clears throat> now in during this time you might have fungi uh, mold bacteria mold you also might have mites mites are small organism that eats the rind the rind they eat the rind and produce um, um, like a, a a cream powder on the on the rind, okay. And you also might develop early blowing into the cheese. Early blowing is when the cheese start to ferment and start to to produce gas inside the cheese, and the cheese will start blowing, okay, and developing gas inside. <clears throat> um, during this phase. Um, you have to control the temperature and the moisture level of your cheese. To do that, you have to measure the temperature of your of, of your cheese cave or your cheese chamber, or if you have a fridge that you can you, that you're using as a cheese chamber, it's all right. But you have to measure the temperature and you have to measure the moisture level. How do you do that? Um, with um, to measure the temperature, of course, you use a thermometer. But to measure the humidity, you need an instrument called hygrometer. Okay, it, it will it, it measure them. It's just more the name, but it, it's very cheap. It costs maybe ten dollars or something like that. I recommend I have in my website, drcasero.com. If you don't, if you want to know 
more about it, just make a comment and I will let you know, send you email, whatever. Okay. In this phase, you also have to flip the, the cheese, turn it over every day during the first week. You flip it every day. Okay. And <clears throat> um, depending of the of the recipe that you are using. Okay. And you have to carry on maturing your cheese during uh, according to the recipe that you're using. After this period of between seven and 30 days comes the second phase of, matura of, mat of mat maturation. In this phase, you in general terms, we decrease the temperature, we lower the temperature a little bit more and also lower the level of humidity, the, of moisture into the, into the cheese chamber. In, uh, because we are reducing the temperature and we're also reducing the moisture level some mold bacteria might die and they will the, the, the cheese will start to becoming like black or something or gray for example if we are if we are ripening uh, penicillin camemberti which is a white mold bacteria <coughs> it's a well it's a white mold sorry and if you lower the temperature and lower the um, the moisture level is the mold will become like gray because it's dying. Doesn't matter, don't worry about it. This is perfectly normal. In this way, you might brush your teeth. You brush your cheese, sorry. In this way, you brush your cheese and the mold will grow again because it will get used to the lack of oxygen in, and, the lack, and, the la, and the lack of humidity. And it will also get used to the lower temperature and it will start growing again okay and also maybe another type of of mold or fungus might appear okay um with uh, along with the cheat with, with the mold that you are using if you are using um a, a mold in, in, in ripening your cheese you also in this in this second phase might use a, a bacteria called brevibacterium li brevibacterium linens okay which is a bacteria that put the uh, make the cheese red on the outside, and we use this bacteria to you to make a cheese called Port Salut, also to make monster cheese. Okay, and but it, as I said, it will depend on the recipe that you are using. In this second phase, you have to turn your cheese, but you don't have to turn it every day. You can turn it once a week. Uh, and eventually you may turn it fortnightly or once a month because the cheese will become drier and drier. It won't be necessary to turn it every day. So you and, and so this flipping process can change to more uh, um, um, space, to more space uh, in, in, instead of one day every day, once a week, as I said, okay? In this Phase you might also, if you're making blue vein cheese, it's time to pierce your cheese. So all the, the affiner, all, all the all the tuner needs to know all these processes. Okay. So um, if you are making a gorgonzola, for example, which is a blue vein, you know that in your second phase you have to pierce your cheese. What is piercing the cheese? You have to pin it make holes through so the oxygen can get inside the cheese and the mold can grow in the inside the cheese okay this second phase of maturation may last may last 30 days or up to two years okay and in this phase in this second phase you have to make your first test what is the test that you make you have to use like a small knife i have it here let me find it here, uh, here. So, wait. Is this one? Let me take it out. Sorry for not having it ready. Your trial is this. This is like a small knife that you, if this is the cheese, you make a hole into the cheese like this. Okay. You pin the cheese in the inside and take a sample without cutting the cheese. And then you, um, this cheese trial. Um, can take the, as I said, this section, the cheese will have all the moisture inside the cheese without, without even opening it, just making a small hole, turn it up, take the sample out, and, and then you have to smell it and 
review the cheese inside, evaluate the cheese. Even you can even try the cheese to see if, if the bitterness is developing or not. If, if bitter is if the bitterness is developing, you know that you you can um, it's not ready. It's still green. Uh, and the good thing about using this dryer is that the piece that you took, you can put it back again into the into the cheese, and the cheese won't lose any type of moisture inside. Okay. And okay, this is the first test of tuning, the first tuning test. After that, you might pass for the last phase of maturation, which is um, because the cheese has been in the cheese chamber for so long, it might become drier if you haven't vacuum packed it. So it's time to paint it with oil. It doesn't mean that you, you, you're not gonna be able to paint it in the, in the second phase. You might paint it in the second phase, remember. Tuning the cheese, refining the cheese is a personal touch. And maybe in your personal touch, you decided that you're going to paint the cheese during the first phase. It's up to you, okay? As I said, there is no wrong or correct answers. It's your personal touch. But a criteria is that you can uh, paint the cheese with oils in the last phase of maturation. You don't have, you, you might, instead of using oils, you can use herbs, you can use liqueurs, you can use wine, beer, and you can smoke the cheese. The um, heaven is the limit, okay? It doesn't matter. You, um, you can use whatever you want. But in general, in this, you use these aromatic herbs and stuff. You can also uh, wax the cheese, okay? If, there is, if this is the case in your last phase, by waxing the cheese, you are and restricting the humidity to change. Your cheese will, won't lose more water, won't lose more moisture, and the moisture level will become till the, till the consumption of the cheese. But it doesn't mean that the cheese will start changing inside because the moisture level is, con is continue, continuously, is continuous. Um, the cheese will start, uh, will carry on developing all the flavors and um, it will, um, the proteolysis inside the cheese, we'll see, uh, we'll talk about proteolysis a little bit later in, in during the course or during the, the, all the shows. Um, proteolysis is when the, the fat of the cheese tends to change to the nature. Okay, but we'll talk about it later. Um, also, um, in this last process, the maintenance, um, you have to maintain, sorry, the um, the temperature and humidity maybe you can lower it a little a little bit more okay and in this last phase you are going to make your second tuning test with the trier the second and this is when you're going to decide if your cheese is ready or not okay um when you make for example cheddar and you're making if you're making it for yourself okay you make one piece but in general terms if we are making ch uh, cheddar for com commercial purposes we make instead of one we make five ten it, it, it will depend and then we use one piece try it test it and let, uh, let it uh, carry on ripening and in this way we can know if, if the cheese is ready for consumption. Uh, you, we might try um, the same piece in the second in the second in the second in the last phase of maturation. We can try again the same block of cheese, the, the same unit, or try another unit. It will, I mean, it's your choice. Okay. Um, well, this is all I wanted to tell you about the, the um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the refining process of the cheese. Um, Next week, we are going to speak about a very good topic, which is the Italian cheeses. I'm going to teach you what bacteria, um, I'm gonna teach you how to make pasta filata cheeses. Pasta filata is the, the curd that we use to make mozzarella, provolone, to make um, um, 
Colombian cheese is called double, double cream cheese. We have one cheese in Venezuela. I am from Venezuela called hand cheese. Um, Stracchino, eh, no Stracchino, eh, Scamorza, Burrata, all these Italian cheeses and, eh, are, comes from what we call pasta filata. Okay? And I'm going to teach you how to make it um, the, the normal way, I mean the Italian way, using lactic acid, lactic bacteria. And I'm going to teach you what pH to consider, what type of bacteria do you have to use, uh, what pH you have to weigh off, or, or you have to drain away. I mean, I'm going to teach you all this stuff and you guys can, so, and, and all the, the, um, the problem that you might have when you are making this type of curd. Sometimes your cheese becomes a little bit dry. Sometimes when you are, even though if we get the pH that we are, the pH target, um, sometimes the curd doesn't stretch. Why, ha why this happen is happening? Uh, I'm going to teach you all that. So um, the, the, the theme is a little bit long. Maybe we're going to split it in two classes. But anyway, we're going to start it. So if you come to my next show, you will be able to learn how to make it, okay? Um, if you want to follow my social media, go to my website. This is my website, drquesero.com. Quesero means cheese maker in Spanish. I speak Spanish. This is my Latin, my, my native language, my mother tongue. And if you want to follow me in my social media, follow me in Facebook. I will I would be very happy to have you there. If you have questions, I would be very happy to answer them. Don't worry about it. Follow me in Facebook. You can follow me in Instagram, which is uh, at Dr. Quesero, Dr. Quesero. Follow me in Twitter at Dr. Quesero, and of course, you are watching this stream and my YouTube channel, Dr. Quesero TV, okay? Follow me in this. I would be very honored having you as a follower, okay? And of course, if you want to uh, help me to support the channel so I can make more content to give you um, more videos, how to make cheese, and how, uh, and as I said, my plan is to teach you how to um, how uh, to teach you to learn how to make cheese, and you can join to my membership program, okay, to support the channel. If you want to buy my my merchandise, this is always um, these are messages that I always say. For example, a life. These are in Spanish. I have it also in English. A life without cheese is like a love without a kiss. I always say that. And well, if you want to have something from the channel, we can support it. I, I'm just expecting mine. And when I have it, I will be with the shirt and it will sit. It will sit. But uh, it hasn't arrived yet. Okay. And um, this is also more merchandise. See, for example, here, let's make some cheese. And they are some, uh, another, uh, these are in Spanish. There are another, another key we saying that, that we say here in New Zealand that they are in the store, but they're not here. But anyway, they're very cool. OK, now let's go with the Q&A. If you have any question, I will be very happy to answer your questions. OK, Ooh, what happened? Wait. Yes. Okay, let's go with the with the questions. Okay. Here it is. Jason. Jason is asking. 
I'm in the middle of a cheese make. I realized that I added two liter rennet. Do I add more or do I wait longer? Help, please. Okay. Um, if you put two liter rennet, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, but you have to pay the price. You can put more rennet if you want, but it will depend on the um, level of curdling that you have in or coagulation that you have into your milk. For example, if your milk, if you put, let's say that you're making 10 liters of milk and you put drops of rennet and your cheese and, and your milk is still liquid, after one hour, your milk is still liquid, which means that you it haven't been coagulated yet. You can add more rennet, okay? And wait for another hour so the rennet can act and, and coagulate your milk. But if your milk is partially coagulated and the, and the curd is very weak, if you put more rennet, and of course, if and you put too little rennet because there is still milk and that hasn't been coagulated yet, when you put new rennet, you're going to cut curd that is already coagulated. So the thing is that this new rennet will coagulate your new milk, but by stirring, you will break um, the, um, the curd that is already curd, curdled. So in this way, in this case, you're going to have a um, way with coagulated milk. And you will have, um, you will lose a little bit of yield, okay? Instead of your performance uh, having, for example, eight liters per eight liters per kilo, you're gonna have a little bit less. What I what I what I would suggest, if your milk is, if, if your curd is strong enough, just leave it like that. Okay, cut it, make the cheese, and I know that you have a lot of milk. Oh, you have more milk that is not being coagulated yet. Doesn't matter finish your cheese, and after that, grab the whey, recover it, filter it, boil, um, heat it up to 85 degrees, and make ricotta, okay? This is the best that you can do, okay? And next time, be careful, and don't get distracted making your cheese, and put the right amount of rennet. This is what I suggest you to do, okay? Okay, second question from Lindsay. Uh, I messed up a bag yesterday got distracted and cooked my curd I wound up with a very dry curd it's been my experience in the first in the past that cheeses like this turn out bitter I guess the question is because of the excessive dryness of is salt not able to get to get in during bringing and does that lead to the bitterness or is there something else at play? Look, bitterness doesn't have to do anything with your dry salt. Um, if you got distracted, okay, it happened. We say in English, shit happens. <laughs> and um, but bitterness is because or something else. Bitterness normally occur when you will put too much rennet, or sometimes during the maturation process of the cheese, as I said before, the, um, the breakdown of the protein will tend to, to, um, to produce uh, peptides, uh, uh, will tend to, um, to, get pro to get peptides that produce bitterness. And this bitterness tends to disappear during the maturation process. So, um, it's, but it's, it, salt doesn't have to do anything with it either, okay? Um, it just happened to you because maybe you put too much rennet. So you, uh, my suggestion, try to eliminate variables. Try to reduce the level of, of rennet be, um, between normal parameters, of course, because if you put too little rennet, you will have coagulating problems. If you put too much rennet, you have bitter bitterness in your cheese. So try to 
Um, try to, uh, if I were you, I would use the recommended dose of the supplier, but they also, they also or they always offer like a bandwidth, the low bandwidth and the up and the high bandwidth. Use the low bandwidth to see what happens and try to make the cheese again. Okay, this is what I would do. Uh, okay, another question. Ellie, I am making mozzarella with unpasteurized milk. Heated, heated the milk between 30 and 38 degrees Celsius and cheddarized the curd to a pH range of 5 or 4.5, 4.9. And my mozzarella is stretching, but uh, it's stretching well, but becomes too dry inside. What should I do? Okay, look. You're using past on pasteurized, sorry, which means that you're on pasteurized milk, you're using raw milk. To make mozzarella, I wouldn't recommend to use raw milk. But anyway, if you're using raw milk, why I don't recommend to use raw milk? Because if you are making mozzarella, if your cows are sick, even though so you apply heat to the curd and you might kill some bacteria, you won't kill them all. So you still have this Damocles sword here on your shoulders, which maybe you can get sick or your clients will get sick. And I would suggest you to pasteurize them. But anyway, that's not the problem. The problem is that your mozzarella is too dry. So um, I'm noticing here that 5.0 and 4.9, this window is too, too big. No, mozzarella, normally, they, um, if, you, if you achieve 4.9, it means that you reach this level of acidity, and this level of, of acidity will tend to denature more calcium. Therefore, your mozzarella might get dry. Try to work in the window between 5.1 and 5.3, not 5.0 and 4.9. This is too big. Sh um, shorten your window between 5.1 and 5.3. I always work with 5.3, okay? And when I'm making mozzarella, because a max 5.2, I never reach 5.1 unless it's, um, um, I'm obliged for it, for it okay? So um, try to use this. Another way, if your mozzarella, if your mozzarella, when you make it, is still dry, this is normal because when you are acidifying the mozzarella um, or the fast, or, or, or when you are acidifying the curd, um, the acidification process tends to make the curd a little bit hydrophobic, which means that they will repel the water, and the, and and. Because they repel in the water, they'll tend to be a little bit dry. For this, you can do, um, you can let your cheese into the fridge for one week, back in vacuum pack it or wrap it up with plastic film so they don't lose moisture, and let it protolize a little bit. Okay, the, 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 um, for a week maybe. In a week, the curd will start absorbing. Um, absorbing water and being less hydrophobic and they will um, stretch perfectly and they will tend to be more more um, smooth and less dry. Um, another way that I, I have used is to soak the cheese or soak the mozzarella into a solution of a brine solution, but very, very low, one or two percent of brine solution. No, not even two percent. I would say half percent brine solution. Put the mozzarella inside in there, and let it get hydrated for um, six hours, depending on the batch of the mozzarella. Okay, to allow the mozzarella to for by um, through osmosis. They try to absorb a little bit of water and it won't become so dry. Okay? And this is what I would suggest you to do. Okay? Okay, let's go with the other one. I am making, uh, sorry, can I make cheese with powdered milk? Yes, 
you can make cheese with powdered milk, but um, it's very hard to make mozzarella with powdered milk. You can make fresh cheeses with powdered milk. I have used with a splendid uh, result. Uh, um, making chevre, for example, making in uh, not chevre because chevre is cow's milk with with goat milk. Um, but um, I have made queso fresco with um, with um, powder milk. Um, you can make lactic uh, uh, lactic cheeses, for example. Uh, yeah, lactic cheeses. You can make yogurt cheese with powder milk. You can use, uh, you can you can make also uh, mascarpone with powdered milk, okay? Um, but you can make pasta filata cheese. It's very hard um, to make it. I haven't made it yet. I made it once and it didn't stretch perfectly. But I all, uh, once I make mozzarella, but it, didn't, it was too dry, it didn't stretch that much. So, um, but you can make this type of cheeses, <clears throat> fresh cheeses, okay? Uh, Mauri, how can I maintain the temperature of the milk out of the stove? Okay, when you are making cheese, you can heat the milk in two ways. You can use your stove or you can use a double boiler. I use both. Um, when I'm making my videos, I use the stove. When I'm making cheese professionally, I use my double boiler or cheese vat. I use a cheese vat. Okay. Um, if you have, if you take the, if you take your stove out of the, out of the, if you take your milk out of the stove, a good advice is to put the lid of the of the pan, put the lid on, put the lid of the. I have a, a glass lid. Put it on the top. And but if you if your pan. If, if, if sorry, if your lid is not made of glass, it's from steel, and it won't lock accordingly. Maybe you could cover your your pan with cloth, okay, to keep um, the heat. Um, you can also put it in a chili bean. Maybe put it in a chili bean, and that's another way to, to do it. The idea is, I mean. The idea is to preserve the heat. You find a way how to do it. Um, you can put your pan into a into a polystyrene cheese, uh, into a polystyrene bean. I mean, as I said, try to find a way to um, maintain the temperature inside. It's very important because if you lower the temperature too much, more than two degrees, the bacteria will not have the correct environment and will not carry on feeding from the lactose, and therefore they won't be care, uh, producing lactic acid, which you need to you need this lactic acid to lower the acidity level of the cheese to occur. Um, another person said here, uh, can I add butter to the raw cow milk to make fresh mozzarella because the mozzarella is becoming too dry? You might have, <coughs> sorry, um, you may add yes butter, but instead of adding butter, it's cheaper if you add cream. Um, the thing is that if you add too much cream, it will affect your casein fat ratio, and maybe your um, you will have synergesis problems. Synergesis is um. Synergesis is, uh, is um, the um, expel of the whey from the from the curd. We'll we'll talk about it in later programs, okay? And so you have to be careful. Try to try to um, try what I said before. Try to put soak it into the brine to see what happens. Okay. Uh, let me see. How are we with the time? We have fifteen minutes left. Okay, we still have time. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Can you please explain the difference between vinegar and rennet? 
Can I make a real cheese using vinegar? Okay, look, you, I don't have your name here anyway. Look, to make cheese, you can use either, either vinegar or rennet. The thing is that when you use, and each, each ingredient has different purposes. I mean, you can, if you're gonna make, for example, you're gonna make cheddar, you can coagulate your milk with vinegar. Because if you, um, vinegar is used with, in another type of cheeses, okay? Vinegar is normally used when we are making chemical acidification. And we use rennet when, you are, when we are making microbial um, coagulation of the curd. You're using vinegar to coagulate your milk. This is because you are rich, uh, lowering the pH of your, of your milk until it curdles, okay? But when we, when we use, if we, if we make vinegar to make cheese, okay, the cheese will be too acid and therefore the synergies will be affected. So we use microbial rennet, which is chemosin, it's an enzyme, um, to, 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 to get the same effect when the milk is still sweet, when the milk is still, uh, it, it's not acid. Okay, so um, these are different processes and therefore you will achieve different type of cheeses. When you make, uh, when you use milk, uh, when you use rennet, you make most of the cheeses of the, of the world. You can make, um, even though the acid ones, um, you can make cheddar, you can make mozzarella, you can make, oh, what I mean by mozzarella is any pasta filata cheese, provolone, you can make, you can make blue veins, you can make um, wash curd cheeses, um, dot cheeses, um, like gouda. Okay. Anyway, you can make any, this type of cheese. When you're using vinegar, is to make, cheeses, like lactic cheeses, okay? Um, also, you can use vinegar to make a cheese from India called paneer. If you make, if you use paneer to make, if you use uh, vinegar to make paneer, okay, you will curdle your milk, you, you will coagulate your milk, but your cheese won't have much flavor because what you did is only to uh, coagulate your milk or to curdle your milk, by changing the acidity. If you use microbial rennet, you are getting the same effect, but beside the, the coagulation process, you, you also are having enzymes that will, have, that will help you during the maturation process of the cheese. You will have proteolysis inside the cheese, you will have uh, lipolysis in, into the cheese, which these are two processes into, into the uh, uh, ripening process of the cheese that will affect texture and flavor. And um, by using vinegar, it's very hard to do that. You can, you, vinegar is only for fresh cheeses. So my advice, use both, depending on the cheese that you are using, okay? Um, these are the main difference that I, that, I, that I see. I hope I have, I have answered your question, okay? And... Another question here from George. Do you recommend making yogurt with raw milk that has been pasteurized and how long this yogurt can last into the fridge? Well, look, um, George, if you are making yogurt with raw milk and your milk is being pasteurized, you're gonna get an excellent yogurt, okay? Because of course, <coughs> if you pasteurize your milk with a short, um, sorry, with a long period, sorry, short period of time, and, um, so, sorry, slow temperature, long period of time. Slow temperature means 63 degrees for half an hour, which is a long period of time. Um, this is the, if you pasteurize your milk in, in these parameters, 
in, for example, 63 degrees up to 69 degrees. And the time is between half an hour and one minute. In these time frames, you're going to have an outstanding product, a very good product. But if you use raw milk and you ultra pasteurize your milk or you over pasteurize your milk, your yogurt will be low quality because if you over pasteurize your milk, your milk, even though if it is raw, you will denature the protein or you will denature the casein into the into the milk. Therefore, your yogurt will not coagulate accordingly. So you have to be careful. You have to be careful. How long can it last into the fridge? It doesn't matter. It will last a lot. The thing is that it won't become uh, solid as yogurt normally normally does because you have denatured all the all the casein. So um, it will last a lot because yogurt reach a pH of 4.0, which is a very acid pH, and it will protect the coagulated milk from getting in, uh, cross contaminated with bacteria. Okay. Of course, try to try to put it into into the jar. Try to sterilize or sanitize the jar for, before you put in the the um, the milk with the bacteria. And in this way, you can have your 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 um, your yogurt for a long period of time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> of course, if you use it within a month, this is a general time frame while the, while the bacteria inside the yogurt is still alive. After a month, the bacteria will tend to die. And the, there's not going to be many nutrients after a month. So I would suggest put it using one month. But it's not going to get rotten because the acidity won't allow the milk to get rotten because um and this uh, this acidity level will preserve the cheese uh, will preserve the, the yogurt so um but if you want if you if you are if, if your goal is to achieve a um, nutri nu uh, nutrition product from your yogurt try to use it within a month okay another question here how are we with the time? Ooh, a minute ago. Uh, okay. Um, another question here. How to pasteurize the whey? Ooh, this is a very important question. This is a very good question. I don't have your name. Sorry about that. Uh, these are questions that I, I always have into my channel. People ask me, and I just always send them here to the program. So if you guys made the question, Come here to my show, and you will have your answer. Okay, I, this in this in this way, I am, I am more efficient answering my questions. Okay, during the during the week. <clears throat> How to pasteurize your way? Very easy. When you pasteurize your way, you have to apply heat for a certain period of time, and then you have to maintain this heat, as I said, for a certain period of time, and then you have to Cool up really fast the that you have pasteurized or the way that you have pasteurized or the juice that you have pasteurized. You can pasteurize anything, including whey. One way is <clears throat> to heat the whey up to 63 degrees. Keep the temperature for half an hour. And then this way that is being maintained for half an hour, put it in a double boiler, but instead of putting hot, put um, ice water, okay, and stir. Stir. What I do, if you're doing it at home, <clears throat> fill up the sink with ice water, especially if here, for example, here we have winter, I don't have to put ice. But if you are in countries like Saudi Arabia, where we have a lot of heat, put the sink and um, put ice water. You, if you don't have ice water, you can put ice ice bags or ice packs. These are health that are frozen and are very cold. And then you, when they get melted, you put it back into the fridge and they get melted again. So it will save you a lot of money because you don't have ice. You don't need ice. It's ice packs.
So um, you can put these ice packs into the water. Put your your pan into your sink. Of course, don't let the water come into the inside inside the milk. And then put the put um, just soak the um, the pot into your sink to allow the cold water to be on the side of the, of your pan and start stirring. And thermometer in hand. Measuring the temperature, but it's very important that you start to stir not very hard because you can break the fat into the into the, of the milk. Not very hard. Try to stir slowly, and you will notice that your temperature will decrease. Start to and uh, try to lower the um, the temperature in 15, 20 minutes, up to half an hour, depending of the amount of water on. And sorry, and the amount of milk that you are heating. You, if you are heating, for example, 10 liters, you can reach, you can lower your temperature in 10 minutes if you stir perfectly and you have a good source of ice water on the outside. You don't have to take your temp, you don't have to take your way to four to five degrees. You can take it to 30, 25 degrees. Okay. And then the one that is cool at 25 degrees, the, the bacteria have died, and you can boil it, boil it, put it in bottles, boil it up, and then put it into the um, cap, cap it, make, put a lid on it, the other cap, and then you can um, put it into the into your into your fridge, okay? Or if you have a commercial a, a commercial refrigerator, put it into your racks and stuff, and then put it back in the in the fridge, and then to uh, to care to allow the fridge to lower the temperature even even a little bit more. Okay, and um, as I said, start sixty three half an hour. But you can, as long as you reach, as you increase the temperature, you can start reducing the waiting time. For example, what I do is I pasteurize my milk, heating at sixty nine point four, not even seventy sixty nine. Sorry, sixty nine point three. And I wait for only one minute, and I, it will give me time to work fast. Because waiting time, half an hour, waiting half an hour for your milk to get pasteurized, time is money, and you, you can do something else. So I just, um, and you use this time to do something more productive instead of waiting. Instead of waiting, so um, you, uh, what I do is I heat up at sixty-nine point three, keep the temperature for one minute, and then after the minute. I have everything ready. I just start um, lo um, lo lowering the temperature by putting the, the, the milk into the um, uh, ice water and stirring to lower the temperature. To, uh, just to, uh, in, in my case, it's milk up to the uh, temperature of the recipe. But if, in your case that you are doing whey, <clears throat> you can take it to 20 degrees and put it to the fridge. And carry on cooling it up to four degrees, unless you're gonna use it for other purposes. If, if you're going to make, if you if your recipe is to mix it with any product, okay, just lower it up to the um, temperature the, the temperature of your recipe. Okay, and last question, Tracy, please can someone advise me? I have a 1.9 by 1.9 meter outside cold room. It's an old farm cold room and it's fully isolated. I want to utilize this as a cheese cave. The cooling part is easy. It's easy enough, but how do I control the humidity? Can I can I can you advise please? This is a very complicated question. Anyway. I'll try to answer it. Okay, you have this room outside your house. No problem. You can control your temperature, okay, because it's fully isolated. However, if you're going to control your temperature at four degrees, you have to use a compressor, which will allow you to achieve four degrees, eight degrees. You have to achieve between four and 
11 degrees, depending on the cheetah you are ripening. To increase your humidity level, you can have containers, for example, some some uh, and 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 put an hygrometer into into your into your cheese cave, and you can spray water with fans. You can use that. Another way is put buckets full of water into your into your cheese cave okay just expose so the water will evaporate and you will achieve you will increase you you will have at least 80 percent if you want to increase at 90 percent instead of putting a bucket put like a bathtub i mean the idea is to increase the exposure area of the water so the evaporation rate will be higher Therefore, your humidity level will be higher. And use your hygrometer to monitor your humidity level. You can do that. Because this is what I do. But I do it not in a cheesecake. I do it in my fridge. Okay, I put water. And sometimes I am ripening more than two cheeses. They, and they need different uh, moisture level at the same time. One needs... 80 percent the other one needs 95 percent so what i do is i wrap in my cheeses into plastic containers and i close it hermetically i leave i put the water inside the container very carefully and put it into the fridge one cheese has a small cup the other cheese has a small plate therefore the cheese that has a small plate will have a bigger exposure area and the evaporation rate will be more, uh, higher. Therefore, this cheese will have 90%, 95%. And I use my hygrometer to monitor all this. This is a very easy and inexpensive way to do it. Okay. Well, <clears throat> let me see if I have another question here. Um, no, we are over time. Well, thank you for joining me into my, ch into my show. As I said, uh, if you're not subscribed, Already, already subscribe it. Subscribe to my channel. I invite you to do it so you can have from first um, side and uh, all the content that we are continuously uploading. Thank you all for having for supporting me here today. As I said, I'm going to make this show every Saturday now in the, in, in this area of the world in Singapore, in China, in India, in Saudi Arabia is day daylight so you guys can attend my show if you want to learn how to make cheese okay of course you have the the, the show will be in english you will need to uh, speak english at least understand english i don't speak arabic <laughs> i don't speak chinese i don't speak hindi and i don't speak um and i speak okay so um welcome to my show once again to my show and as i always say eat cheese because life without cheese is a love without a kiss See you next week, and next week we're going to speak about pasta filata, okay? Be careful. Take care. Bye.